Okay, great. Uh, where am I at? The recording has begun. Okay. Any consent? Yeah. Okay. Um, we consent. I yeah. Thank you. Okay. Oh, there's Father Ben. He's looks like he's going to join us by phone. Or I don't know. No, he's got a picture there. So there's Father Elijah. Okay, good. And we're. No, Father Ben, he's moving. I thought I was getting a, a solid, okay. Hi, Father Ben. Okay, well. All right, Amos, lead us in prayer. Oh, heaven, we came the comforter, the spirit of truth, where everywhere present and fills all things. Treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity and save our souls, O good one. Amen. 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 He's polite. He does put up. All right. Well, um, I'll go ahead and begin if it's okay uh, in the interest of time. Um, I want to begin by thanking His Eminence for giving me the privilege and opportunity to work with each and every one of you to pull this together uh, in this fashion. And so I think this, is, this has been a, an enormous uh, blessing in that regard. Uh, today, we're going to actually make some amazing history here, not only amazing history for your blessed diocese, but also because, because of the COVID situation, we're going to have to do everything on Zoom, and we're actually going to try and consolidate what have been two and a half days down to one and a quarter day. So we had to do a variety of different adjustments in the overall process. And one of the byproducts of that, unfortunately, is a lot less interaction and a lot less interactive time. And I apologize for that. But in the interest of trying to get through this body of work within the available time slot, uh, we're going to try and do the best we can. And if at any time it, it feels rushed to anybody, you know, signal it and I'll slow it down a little bit. And even if we don't all get it done, we'll figure it out. But um, I really do think that this is going to be an extraordinary opportunity. And I want to thank um, almost every one of you did a wonderful job of completing the first, the homework, and then the survey. It took a few prompts for some folks, but we, uh, we eventually got uh, almost all of them in. And you'll see how it all came together. And, and again, we had to do it this way because we, aren't un we are unable to be together in, uh, in person. Uh, so while a lot of people told us that this would be impossible to do, you know, everything was considered impossible at one point. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm blessed to know some of you. I don't know all of you. So just two seconds of background. I actually began my journey about 13 years ago. This part of the journey, uh, I've traveled well over 325,000 miles back when that was a thing, uh, back when you can actually travel. Uh, and I've been blessed to do uh, presentations to over 500 Orthodox parishes and complete a financial stewardship analysis for over 275 parishes, which we can talk about later. Uh, this isn't all of the places I've been during the entire 13 years. This is just about the last five or six years, but this is how I spent my, uh, my weekends and my weeks and whatnot. Uh, what all of that led to was assembling a, an amazing database of issues that are facing these you know, parishes all over the place. And it resulted in the creation of the effective church model, the four dimensions of an effective church. And what we discovered after, after aggregating all of this data was that there were four dimensions to have the most effective church we could possibly have. We have to have engaged disciples that are pursuing a culture of true stewardship and generosity in pursuit of a consensus vision with a plan to achieve it all unified by an effective worship experience. And of course, what, what makes this unique from other nonprofits is that Christ has to be at the center of everything that we do. And so there are elements and aspects and, and ideas and things that we do in each one of these categories. If you're interested in the effective church model, you can go to my always free website, stewardshipcalling.com. And the very first tab you'll come across is the effective church model. And if you clicked on that, you would be able to download videos that, that, that actually teach each of those elements in the PowerPoints. But during the course of the next day and a quarter, we're going to be focused on that upper right-hand quadrant of trying to create a, a consensus vision and a plan, in this case, for the diocese. 
Uh, this work uh, began probably about seven years ago for me, not in your diocese, but by the grace of God. Um, uh, I've now completed strategic plans that when you count the number of Orthodox Christians that live in those areas, whether they're uh, dioceses, metropolises, national churches, or even parishes, it, it's just about 26% of Orthodox Christians live in jurisdictions in which I've been blessed to do these plans. Now, that shouldn't impress you. It just means I'm old and I've been doing this for a while. But again, what it does mean is that we've aggregated a process that can work and we've aggregated an enormous amount of data that tells us the consistent challenges and issues that we're facing throughout the Orthodox ecosystem. And again, if you're interested in this, back to my website, and this is the one that, that I really will focus your attention on, under the strategic planning tab, there's a drop down and it goes down forever. You can actually find every strategic plan that I've worked on and you will notice that I have created your very own page. So all the way down there and it's circled the second circle in red and it says OCA Diocese of the Midwest Strategic Plan. Now on that page, everything we do together will be housed. So you can always go back and do that. So for example, even the video from this presentation, when it gets done, um, you know, you may put it up on your diocese website, but we're also going to put it here. And every document that you have produced and every document you're going to produce will be housed there until your plan is completed, at which point the final completed plan will be ported over to your diocese website. So this is a handy and convenient place for you to go to keep track of everything that's happening every step of the way. If you go to that website right now, what you'll find, and I sent you an email alluding to that, and I hope some of you did, I, I think I counted 13 of you did, um, that you would have seen the heat map results of the SWOT analysis, the core values, the WIGs, and you would have also seen a this PowerPoint presentation that's already been uploaded up to that location. So I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly. You may wanna go back and refer to some of the elements and information on there, it's there and it will be there for you forever. Uh, and so all you have to do is go to the uh, stewardshipcalling.com, the strategic planning tab, and then drop down to your uh, OCA Diocese Midwest and you'll find it there. Now, one of the things that I realized early on as we started this ministry is that kind of the most important question I can ever ask anybody is the why question. Uh, I, I've asked it so often and so many times now for the last 13 years that I, I've gotten the nickname of the Orthodox Y guy, not wise guy, just Y guy, right? So, because I'm always asking this question. And I really do sincerely think that this is the most profound question that everyone needs to ask in their own lives. And they also need to ask for their parishes and their diocese and their national church. Now, when we start to focus on the personal side, because that's the logical place to start in this regard, we, we, we really try to look to discover what I call your stewardship calling, that which you are called to do with all the gifts that God gave you. And kind of really what got my attention focused on this was an incredible passage that really kind of woke me up from 2 Corinthians 5.10, a prayer that's buried in the middle of the divine liturgy, where we, we it's a bit of a selfish prayer because we're looking at what we want the end of our our life to look like. Uh, we want it to be, you know, Christian and without pain, blameless and peaceful. But what we really focus on is the big ask, as I refer to it, for a good account before the awesome judgment seat of Christ. Because that is what differentiates us as Orthodox Christians from those, for example, that are not Christian. We know we will live forever. That is a settled issue. Uh, as I like to joke around, the only question is, will we like where we are? And so what I ask you to start to reflect upon in the context of what we're going to do here today is not only answering this question for yourself. And for example, I use this prayer at the beginning of every day and at the end of every day, and you're welcome to do the same thing. At the beginning of every day, I, as I pray this prayer, I ask the Lord to allow me to do something in this day that will help prepare a good account before the awesome judgment seat of Christ. And at the end of every day, I reflect upon the day that has, that has lapsed, and I ask, what did I do today to try and have a better account before the awesome judgment seat of Christ? Or frankly, did I do something that was a withdrawal from that account? And so however you want to use these things are absolutely fine, but I'm, I'm going to keep focusing on the why, and I'm going to keep focusing on this, this, this perspective, because I think it's important to understand that when we do this, we create a long view and not the short view. We're going to talk a lot about what I call the tyranny of the urgent 
or what we're going to talk about in the context of the disciplines of execution being the whirlwind. Those things that are always interfering with the big important things you want to do. You wake up in the morning, you have a to-do list, and then all of a sudden you get up and you look and your emails exploded, your text messages have exploded, your, your kids are needing, your spouse is needing, something's happening, you're getting telephone calls, and you look at the end of the day and you say, goodness gracious, why didn't I achieve what I, I, I intended to achieve? And again, it's because of that tyranny of the urgent that's constantly demanding our attention. And so we're going to try to manage that. Now, one of the other things that I learned doing this process is that when I first started working with Orthodox people, it was an amazing discovery. And I, I'm so excited to share this with you. And what I found that was in, so incredible about it is it did not matter which Orthodox jurisdiction I was working in. It did not matter which historic country the people in that jurisdiction came from. It dis also did not matter what geography I was in. What I discovered that was so amazing to me is that Orthodox people know everything. They have all the answers. Just ask them and they'll be happy to tell you. And, and so as I started to ask questions, what I realized was that some of them actually had taken the time to get answers and some were just giving opinions. And so one of the things that I, I decided early on in this is to try and help, you know, not being, I'm not trying to be a fact checker of everything, but I, I do want to gather some data and some information to set the stage. Now, any of you that have been to any of my presentations on stewardship or strategic planning or leadership development know that I always begin every one of these trying to level set with a, with, a, with a drink of water through a fire hose of a lot of data. And I keep updating this data. Some of it is more current than others because it's based on availability. So we're gonna start to take a quick look at how the world has changed around us. And, and I, I thought it was really important when I talked to his eminence about this is I wanted to use tonight's session merely to set the stage for what's gonna happen and to give you food for thought. It is my sincere hope that as a result of something that you hear in this presentation, you will lose some sleep tonight. Now, I know that that sounds like a horrible thing to say, but I hope that something that I say today, some piece of information, some data that I share with you, indicts you enough to say that's unacceptable. And, and that way, when we start our work together tomorrow, we'll be able to go at it with a lot more intensity and a lot more direction. So I'm going to give you a quick drink of water through a fire hose over here with just a little bit of level setting data just to let you know what you instinctively know, but, but I'm going to give you some data behind it. So this is, this is basically entitled that we live in exponential times. Now, when you live in exponential times, two things are true. The speed of change is unimaginable and it's accelerating. So can you imagine something that is unimaginable in its speed and yet it's accelerating? And this actually began with some pioneering work. One of the other things that you'll see in the work that I do with you is back to my earlier joke, I don't believe in just sharing with you my opinion. I want to share with you the empirical evidence and data that supports it. So this actually started with some work that was done by a, a teacher, Carl Fish, and, and his, uh, his colleague, Scott McCloyd. And I have then proceeded to update it as we go. And so this data is going to be more updated from their original work. So this side very quickly presents the number of years that it took each of these technologies to reach 50 million users. And you can see that the telephone got there in 75 years and the radio in about half that time in 38 years and the TV in a third of that time for radio down to 13 years. And the internet got the 50 million users four years after Al Gore invented it. No reason we can't have a little political humor along the way here, okay? Uh, and then it was preceded by Google Plus that got to, to uh, 50 million users in only 88 days. And just look at how fast technology has moved. Google Plus is no longer a thing anymore. Google has withdrawn that product. And then it was succeeded by Angry Birds, which is the longest record holder until it was finally beaten by Pokemon Go. Now think about this for just a second. A game, Pokemon Go, reaches 50 million users in 19 days. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, could not reach 50 million people in 19 days. But you can. And that's really the message here, is that we can harness these great tools and these great opportunities to do things in a way that even our Lord did not have available to him. It just is trying to get you to think about the exponential times we're living in. One other data point. A second of, you, of every second, an hour of video is uploaded to YouTube. So an hour of content has just been uploaded to YouTube. An hour of content has just been uploaded to YouTube. Another hour of content has just been uploaded to YouTube. You get the point. 
Now, my question to you is how much of that content is good, solid, orthodox theology? The answer is not enough. And yet we're inundated with this massive influx of media. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but if we were together, I would. I'd say, how many of you are on Facebook? And a fair number of us older folks are. And it only started about 17 years ago, and now it's reached to over 2.41 billion active monthly users. This isn't just the number of people that have accounts. This is the number of people that are active on a monthly basis. And about more than one and a half billion people are active on a daily basis. That's happened literally within the last two decades. And if you think about it, if Facebook were a country, it would actually be the second largest country in the world behind only China, larger than India, and over five and a half times the size of the United States. Within our reasonable lifetimes, we've seen the creation of this global community that has all of the opportunities and frankly, all of the challenges associated with it. We truly are living in exponential times. Another piece of evidence of that is that, now this is again old date in 2014, in the United States alone, there was an estimated 8.5 billion text messages every day. Just think about that. Something that just as, I mean, you all can probably remember before the day we had the capability to do text messaging. Now, here's a data point that is both to show you the speed in which changes happen, but also I wanted to plant a seed for you as to how outdated the communications you are using to reach your parishioners and your parishes are. 97% of American adults text. Okay, so that is a huge percentage of American adults. But here's the thing I wanted to focus your attention on. Text messages have a 98% open rate versus only 20% for email. So when you start to think about, oh, we're communicating with our parishioners and our faithful and our ministries and my clergy via email, well, maybe, maybe, and, and maybe it takes three reminders before they open it, like we did for some of the survey data, and maybe they never get to it because the data also suggests that a little over 60% of text of email messages go directly into somebody's spam filter. So just within the short duration of our lifetime, because we can all remember before there was text messaging, we thought email was such a great innovation. It has essentially been replaced in terms of effective. Now, we're still going to use email because of its ability for broad reach. But if you're looking for impact and effectiveness, it's not going to be the most effective. And the evidence of this shows that 95% of all text messages are read in under three minutes. And every one of you can tell the story of how you were driving along, right? And then all of a sudden your, your telephone would beep or buzz or play the national anthem of your home country or your college fight song or my kids program mine to do the minions, you know, thing. Oh, hello. And, 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 and you know you're going to be in your destination in three or four or five or 10 or 15 minutes, but you can't help yourself. Violating every law, you reach down and you pick up and you take a look at it right? That's, the, that's just an impact of what's going on. All right, one more little data point that I wanted to share with you that one out of every eight couples married in the United States in 2005 actually met online. And that is staggering until we were able to update this information to 2013. By 2013, one out of three couples actually met online. Now, I have a ton more data that I could share with you to show you the order of magnitude by which the world is changing around us, but I think you've gotten the point. I think you are starting to recognize that we are living in exponential times. It is changing so rapidly around us that we have to acknowledge that, and we have to ask ourselves the question, so what does this mean for our parishes and our parishioners? And usually when I present some of this data, this is the reaction I, I get from people, you know, particularly when they start thinking about one out of three couples uh, getting a meeting online. For, a, for over 13 years now, I have used this slide. It was a direct quote, or two quotes actually, from Jack Welch, the former chairman and CEO of General Electric, who famously said that if the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. And then he, then he made it more abbreviated when he said change before you have to. See, right now that polar bear is wishing he'd gotten off the iceberg before it melted around him. And I'm not making a global warming statement. So I've been using this slide for 13 years, but here's what's amazing. About a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago now, well before the COVID issue, General Electric 
experienced something that it had never experienced in its history. Because about 15 years ago, General Electric had the highest market cap of any company in the United States. It was the most valuable company in terms of market capitalization of any company in the United States. And yet a couple of years ago, they reduced their dividend down to a penny and they're divesting themselves of their various divisions. Now, what happened? How do you go from an organization that was in the most valuable to an organization that is having to divest itself to survive when the former chairman already recognized that if the rate of change outside is exceeding the rate of change inside, the end is near? Well, the answer is they took their eye off their ball. Their products are no worse. My law firm, we represented a lot of public utilities that would buy GE turbines for nuclear power plants. You may have GE uh, appliances in your house. Their, their, their products are fine. But the, the rate of change of the world around them that exceeded what was happening and their reaction to it caused them to deal or have not properly deal with the issues. And now they're stuck in this mode. And just so we don't think that this only applies in the commercial context, it applies in every nonprofit. And frankly, it applies in our churches. Now, let me be very clear. I am not speaking theologically. I am not speaking sacramentally. I'm not talking about the fundamental precepts of the Orthodox faith that have been proven and tested for over two, almost 2,000 years, okay? But what I am speaking is the operational side of the house, the way in which our parishes and our diocese and our national churches actually operate and function. Again, not talking about the theology. And this led Pastor Rick Warren, who in some circles is controversial, to say something that I think is actually pretty accurate when he said that leaders of a church will either be risk takers, caretakers, or undertakers. The number of times I've listened to clergy say or parish leadership say, oh, we're just going to keep things exactly the way they are. I look at it and say, it's just not going to work because the world around you is changing. The people around you that you're serving are changing. The environment, the, 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 everything in the context of what you're changing, not your theology, but everything else you're doing is changing. And you're trying to keep things exactly the same way. It's just not going to work. Now, the question is, what is it that we can take that are smart and calculated risks versus risks that are foolish and foolhardy? Now, we're not going to always know in advance because sometimes you have to check with something and, and experiment with it. So one of the questions I've been asking now for 13 years is kind of what is the biggest challenge that's facing your parish and diocese? And we're going to do something very dangerous now. We're going to have audience participation part. So I'm going to invite you to unmute yourself and offer your thought of what the biggest challenge facing your parish and diocese, and then please remute, remute yourself. I think it's right now uh, COVID and what happens uh, when we open up back up. Okay. What else? I think it's lack of mission and outreach to others. Okay, excellent. What else? That's it. Once we fix COVID and outreach, we're done. Everything's perfect. Lack of engagement by who we already have as members. Lack of engagement. Oh gosh, that is so right. That's the magic word. We're going to cover. We're going to come back to that one too. You guys lack are nailing it. All three of these are right. Lack of catechesis. Lack of cat catechesis. The other E, the education piece of it. What else? Excellent. Prioritization of the secular life. The church is just something that may or may not fit into people's lives. Right. Where is it that, that we place the value on our, on our theological existence and, and in respect to our daily lives and that whirlwind that's around us? Excellent. Yep. What else? Hmm. All right. Well, I, I, you guys are a lot more astute and uh, wise my first answer to this question is we're not serving good enough coffee in our churches. But anyway, uh, and that may be true, but I don't think that's the fundamental issue. Well, actually, as it turns out, the biggest challenge that are facing your parishes and your diocese is answered right here with this formula. And uh, this is legitimate. I will tell you, I've been expressing this formula, I mean, literally hundreds of times all over the place. And every time I've done it, and this is is a credit to OCA parishes, right? Because I've been doing this at every jurisdiction, every parish I talk to. Only once, and this happened to be up in New York, did anybody actually know 
what this formula is. And it was at one of the presentations I was doing for an OCA parish. This is actually the formula for entropy. entropy yeah. And I don't see somebody knows. Okay. Now I'm, I was a liberal arts major, so I'll confess that even I still didn't understand that. So let me define entropy for you. Everything in the universe eventually moves from an orderly state to a disorderly state. And entropy is what measures that change. So everything we have, everything in the universe is going from some state of orderliness to some state of disorder. And it's entropy that's measuring that change, which leads to the reason why I say this is the challenge is because that if we don't make positive changes, we will get negative changes. The point here, my brothers and sisters is, we have no choice about change. It is going to happen. It is inevitable. It's happening around us. We cannot say, I don't want it to change. We have a choice. We either make positive changes, or if we don't make positive changes, there's only one other result that's possible, and that is we're stuck with the negative change. So hopefully what we're trying to inspire ourselves to do is to get comfortable with the notion that we need to make some changes and then be willing to do the hard work to figure out what are is it that are the positive changes. Well, I wanted to share with you some hard, reliable, empirical data and, and put it in this context to show you, maybe give you a sense of urgency for the change, but I wanted to set a, a dramatic stage for you. So I hope all of you have many years, right? And I know you can sing that wonderful hymn, but here's the point. Let's pretend that this were the moment that you met your maker. This is the moment you stand before the awesome judgment seat of Christ. Now, obviously, we don't know exactly what that test is going to look like. Uh, when I was in school, I used to try and study for the exam, right? If I knew what the questions were, I'd know what to study. But we don't exactly know. So I, I kind of thought about it for a second, and I tried to think about it in a humorous way. And I said, well, if the Lord hired me as his lawyer, now that's funny on two routes. Number one is that there would be any lawyers in heaven at all. And secondly, of all the lawyers, he certainly wouldn't hire this sinful servant. But anyway, if the Lord had hired me as his as his lawyer and said, counselor, give me a question I can ask all my people when they stand before my awesome judgment seat. What's the one question you would give me? And so here's the question that I postulated. And frankly, this is the question I ask myself, and maybe it works for you. But this is Christ talking, not me talking. I think the toughest question he can ask us is, what did you do with my church under your watch, given all the gifts that I gave you? Given all the gifts, talents, abilities, resources, people, parishioners, hierarchs, resources, fantastic buildings, money, everything, everything I gave you, what'd you do with my church, right? And so we start to think about that. We, we can start to say, okay, well, that's a, that's a relevant question. I think, it, you know, whether that is the question or not, that's at least a relevant question. So with that context, I want us to kind of imagine that, you know, and, and I hope that it isn't today, but that if this is the day we're standing before our maker and that's the question, he asks us, what would our report card look like right now? And so I'm going to present to you some empirical data. Please don't argue with me about the empirical data. The source is at the bottom. I encourage you to fact check me, and you'll find the empirical source behind it, okay? I don't like any of the data I'm presenting, so don't, don't accuse me of presenting stuff that I like. I don't like it but it, these are the facts. And I've, I've kind of summarized them in just to a few buckets, just to give you an idea of why I think it's important that we think about positive changes. So first we come to find out that 47% of adults who are raised in the Orthodox church have left it. Let me repeat that. 40%, almost 50% of cradle Orthodox who were raised in the Orthodox church in the United States have left it. So we're not doing so well with those of us that are adults. Well, how are we doing with our kids? Well, you can actually kiss your youth goodbye. 64% of Christian youth leave the church when they leave their families' houses. And again, the sources are at the bottom. These are empirical research sources. I encourage you to look at this because if nothing, will, if you want to get depressed, this will depress you in a heartbeat. Here's two other ways to look at it from two other very empirically reliable sources that measured the number of millennials. This is a smaller subset of youth now. This is those just between the ages of 18 and 29 and asking which of those are now nuns, not the ladies with the black hats, but those that are N-O-N-E-S. They claim no religious affiliation. 
And Pew found that it was about 34%. The Public Religion Research Institute found that it was 39%. Pick your number. It's all, it's clearly more than a third. What this means, and this is why this is so dramatic to me, my brothers and sisters, is these are not kids who had decided to take a break from being Orthodox, like maybe some of us did. You know, I'll be honest with you, I grew up on the South Side. When I went to Northwestern, I used the excuse of there weren't any Orthodox church near Evanston. You know, I kind of didn't go all the time. I would go like maybe once a month. But when we got married, we got married in the Orthodox church. When we raised our kids, we were baptized and raised in the Orthodox church. What this third or more of our kids are saying is, I repudiate my, my childhood religion. Now, we actually won't know for another decade or two whether, what happens, whether they re, re, revert or whatnot. But this is not a good data set. So again, remember, we've lost half our adults. We're losing our kids at a substantially faster rate. Well, how are we doing with the ones we kept plus all the wonderful converts we recruited? Well, there's a lot of measures that you can do, and the Gallup organization has been actually measuring that. I'm going to cite to you one measure, and this one was actually just within an Orthodox ecosystem across all of the 15 canonical jurisdictions, only 26% regularly attend church on Sunday. Now, this is pre-COVID, so obviously, you know, as was mentioned earlier, we're going to have to figure out what this looks like going forward. You'll also look that I gave you the substrata data, and you can actually see that the numbers are much better in the OCA than it is in my home jurisdiction. We're actually the, the bottom of the class that's bringing the average down. But regardless, whether it's 40% or 26% or 21%, that is an ineffective when you think of, we've lost half our adults, we're losing our kids at a rate 2.8 or faster than we lost our adults, and we only got one in four going to church. And then we did a series of studies and we asked this question. Now I'm gonna ask you the question, most of you are clergy, some of you are lady. You don't have to give me the answer out loud. I want you to think about what you think the answer is, but this was actually surveyed. And we asked the question of laity and clergy. And we asked a series of questions, but one of the questions that I thought was most telling is when we asked this question. During the divine liturgy, what percentage of the time is your mind wandering? Now, when we asked the clergy, we asked them about what did they think their laity, not themselves. Hopefully their minds were focused, right? But we asked the laity what percentage of their time their minds were wandering. And then we asked the clergy, what percentage of the time do you think your, your laity, are, are, their minds are wandering? What was fascinating was when, when we asked them together, the laity lied um, because they didn't want to, they, <laughs> can you believe that? And then what was interesting was when we segregated, we realized early on that they need to stop lying um, what we found is that the clergy actually thought the percentage was higher than the laity did. So now I always tell the lady, don't lie. I mean, you shouldn't lie anyway, but clearly you should lie in this case. You're gonna... Anyway, so what we found after we aggregated all the data was that it was between 70 to 80 percent of their time, other than during the homily, during the divine liturgy, their minds were wandering. Now, of course, you know, whenever you look at aggregated data like this, it stratifies itself. So, for example, if you're in the choir, or you're a chanter, or you're you know, a deacon, then your percentage is very low because you're actually engaged. But for all too many of our churches, that's not what's happening. So just to review this part of the data, and then I'm going to shift to some numbers. We've lost half our adults. We're losing the kids at a rate 2.8 times faster or faster. Of everybody we've kept, plus everybody we've, we've, we've recruited uh, uh, in the form of converts, we're only getting about one in four to attend church on Sunday. And when they're in church on Sunday, their heads aren't in the game. So, so far, maybe not so good. Well, let's look at some numbers. Now, this data is admittedly 10 years old. This came from the 2010 survey that was reported in the Atlas of American Orthodox Christian Churches. This data is in the process of being updated because the 2020 Atlas is being uh, analyzed right now. So we won't know the revised data. Uh, that was all complete in 2019, so it'll be pre-COVID. But this gives you a, a quick little snapshot of 10 years ago, kind of where did we look like on the Orthodox ecosystem. And if you were to aggregate all 15 of the, of the canonical jurisdictions, you'd get just north to 815,000, and you can see the relative organization. Now, this is the next piece of data I'm going to give you. It's a very busy chart. I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing this, but what I want to, what I want to focus your attention on is a few key numbers. And then you can go back and download this presentation. As I said, it's available on the website for free forever, and you can pour over these numbers to whatever degree you want. This is OCA data. This is across the entire OCA, okay? And we looked at basically five things. 
total membership, then baptisms, chrismations, weddings, and funerals. Now, this started, this data set started in 2015. You'll note that on the 2015 number, there's a big footnote because it says in 2015, you had 44,546 total members across the OCA. We'll go back to what it was in 2010, and that number was 84,900. None of us believe that you lost 40,000 members in the five years between 2010 and 2015, okay? So that suggests that one or other of these numbers have some problems with them. So I want to put that out there to be very clear with you because I think we, we are not doing a good job of our counting. But let's use your numbers. Now, make it easy for you. Anytime you see green, that's good. It means it's growing. Anytime you see red, it's bad. It means it's going in the wrong direction. So you can see that membership had a couple of years of increases, baptisms, a little bit of a of plateauing, chrismations, a little bit of a plateauing, but a, a slight decline, a little bit increase in weddings, and of course, the regrettable increase in funerals. Um, but look at what I add at the bottom. This is one of the metrics that I keep and I encourage you to keep. It's what I call the net ads. Now, it's not exactly perfect, but it's as close as we can get to being perfect given our data sets. So it's baptisms plus chrismations minus funerals. Now, you can't count a baby that was baptized and chrismated in both columns, right? So we're looking at baptized babies, chrismated adults, and then we subtract funerals. And we try to get a trend line as to whether or not we're growing or declining overall, right? And what you can see here is that there was a big increase between 15 and 16. Actually, too big an increase. It is an anomalously large increase that is somewhat unexplainable. And so I would suggest that one or others of these numbers are not 100% accurate. And that's one of the things that is a real frustration of me is that we are not as good at in our accuracy. And I'm not picking on the OCA. Frankly, y'all do a much better job than virtually every other jurisdiction. So could credit to you all. But, but generally speaking, we don't do as good a job as we could. But overall, what you'll see is that there is an increase in 16 and then a decline in 17 in the net ads. Good news is there's still there's still positive numbers in the, in the sense that we're still adding more in the sum of baptisms and chrismations minus funerals. It's just that the rate of the net ads are going down. So again, both good news and bad news, it's going up. It's just, it's not going up as fast as it was before, but let's do a deeper dive. So this is data from your diocese. And again, it's a, a little bit busy of a chart. You can go back and look at it because I don't want to spend too much time honing in on this. Here we looked at the same data from 17, 18, 19, just looking at your diocese, right? So again, you'll see a mixture of both green and red. Good news, more green than red. Um, Bad news, I don't know what y'all did in 2018, but stop doing it because you had too many funerals and you didn't get in, you, your membership went down. Okay, so anyway, um, but overall your net ads, you know, continued to increase and they were in the positive column all the way. And if you, and if you just look at a 2017 to 2019 comparison, a 36% increase is phenomenal. Okay, it is phenomenal. And yep. so- yeah. Add something to this, I, I, I forgive for my cynicism, but one of the things that happened is that when we moved to percentage giving, how many members we had in the church was no longer a factor in determining uh, what you gave. When we were under per capita system, when you reported higher numbers, that would mean you'd have a higher assessment. Uh, now that we've gone to percentage giving, I find it interesting that we're reporting more members now. And you're, yeah, it's, you're reading my mind. You're about, you're about two seconds before me. So God bless you for that. Right. So remember when I said to you earlier, I had my question marks about data. And, and uh, when you go back and you look at what explains the number of OCA members in the aggregate in 2010 versus 2015, that is a, a part perhaps of the explanation. But I do agree with you that this is part of the reason why we need to um, – uh, detach the economic side from the actual metric side. And we actually need to learn to have some develop, uh, develop some reliable metrics. Um, so I, I'm not, I'm not yet convinced that these are 
perfectly scrubbed and perfectly accurate. I, I think the sacramental one is a lot more because there's a process associated with obviously conducting a sacrament. So I think that data is a lot more accurate. Um, but I, I, I still have some squishiness, I think, in terms of the overall membership. And, you know, part of what made me, you know, a little squishy is when I started seeing, you know, some of these numbers compare. But again, if you look at it, you know, you, you've had a very positive increase in, in baptisms and chrismations year after year after year, and not as fast in funerals. Now, this is taking the, your diocese data and just really honing in just on a couple of factors, just on the membership component. And you can see both change in numbers and change in percentages from 2017 in the bottom to 2019 at the top. But the other thing I wanted to point out to you is let's look back to 1996 because yeah. I just happened to have that data available to me because his eminence made that data available to me. Now, again, we have to make an assumption here that I'm not sure is accurate, but let's make that assumption. And that is that the data in 1996 was accurate data and the data in 2019 was accurate data, okay? So ceteris paribus, right? If all other things are being equal and those numbers have the, either they're, they're the same reliability or the same level of reliability, right? What we can see is overall, we've experienced a pretty significant decline over a, over a slightly more than 20 year period of time. And, and so that is the offset to the good news associated when we look at just the last couple of years, right? So the overall trend line is going down. Now we're doing a little bit better in the last couple of years than we've done historically. But overall, after you take into account all the good that y'all have done in the intervening couple of years, and again, this is all pre-COVID, so things are gonna get a little bit dicey when we start to look at 2020 data. Um, overall, we've got some really bad news here that we that we really have to address. So that's when we start to look at the, the hard, reliable data of our retention, and when we look at our growth, we could see that both of those are going in the wrong direction. Now, one of the other things that came about in this process that, again, I, I had not accurately predicted with as high a degree of accuracy as we can now predict, and that is that the demographic makeup of the Orthodox Church has changed dramatically over the last 15 years. Now, we can look at demographic changes in a lot of different contexts, but let me just present this data to you in a very simple graph, you know, X, Y axis, right? So along the Y axis, we're going to measure, uh, measure what I call passion for the faith or understanding of the faith. Do you, do you really know what it means to be an Orthodox Christian? And, and are you actually practicing that, right? On the X axis, we're going to measure what I call accident of birth and not that accident. So the first category into that are those that are born Orthodox. We, we call them cradle Orthodox. Well, as it turns out, we have two distinct categories of cradle Orthodox in our Orthodox churches. We have incidental cradle Orthodox and we have intentional cradle Orthodox. Now bear with me, I'm gonna define terms in just a second. Let me create the buckets and then I'll go back and fill in the blanks. On the other category of accident of birth, we have those that are born non-Orthodox. We call them converts. And again, as it turns out, we have two very distinct categories of converts in our Orthodox churches. We have those that we call incidental Orthodox converts and those that are intentional Orthodox converts. Now, let me define terms. Every cradle Orthodox enters as an incidental cradle Orthodox. You were baptized as a baby. You had no idea what you were getting into. Your parents and your grandparents and godparents made that decision for you, right? You didn't understand the faith. You didn't understand what it meant to practice the faith. You, there was zero catechesis. You were doing good just not to, you know, spit up on yourself. The problem is, what we've discovered is that a, the significantly highest percentage of cradle Orthodox have remained in that category. So back earlier when somebody said a lack of catechesis, a lack of religious understanding and education, with regard to our cradle Orthodox, that has been proven now to be an acute issue for a majority of our cradle Orthodox. Now, by the grace of God, there are some of our cradle Orthodox that for any number of different reasons went on an intentional journey and actually did the educational work to understand what it really means to be an Orthodox Christian and how they would practice being living an Orthodox Christian life 
you know, the, on a regular basis. Now, on the flip side, on the convert side, we have our nominal Orthodox converts that, and we know that primarily come in via marriage, right? So you have one spouse that's Orthodox, one that's not. The Orthodox spouse wants to get married in the church. The non-Orthodox spouse could care less. They could be a Shriner. They could be an Elk. They could be a Moose. They can be Orthodox. Sure, honey, whatever makes you happy, that's good enough for me, right? They really don't intend to be an actively practicing Orthodox. They're doing it as an accommodation of marriage. They'll do whatever the minimum requirements are. And they want to stay in that relatively ignorant state. And they will be disengaged for the most part. We are blessed, however, and very fortunate. And it has been accelerating over the last 15 years to have a category of intentional Orthodox converts. Now, these folks tended to be something that they were something else they discovered an inadequacy of some form or fashion with what they were. They went on an intentional study journey. They found the Orthodox Church and they embraced it as fully as they could under the circumstance. Now, we could spend a lot more time in this. We don't have time to do that now. And frankly, I, I would suggest to you that you could actually think about everybody in your parish and put them into one of these four buckets, right? And, and start to think of it. But here's the point that I wanted to get across to you. Your job just got four times more difficult than it was 15 years ago when our church was a lot more homogeneous than it is today. Because you now need four different operational strategies to deal with the unique circumstances of these individuals. Let's put it another way. I'm not speaking theologically. I'm not speaking sacramentally. I'm not speaking liturgically. But what I am telling you is that operationally, the needs of these four constituencies are different. And the way they need to be fed and engaged is different. And if you try to do a one size fits all process, you will probably miss the target for all four categories. And so the, I, I don't try to discourage you with this, but I wanted to let you understand that the order of magnitude of the challenges are, are even more dramatic now than ever were before because of the changing demography that we're seeing in our Orthodox churches in America. Now, another thing that I have fun, this is kind of the red state, blue state map based on religiosity. That's a term that you can, that you can have fun with. So the Gallup organization has been measuring religiosity by state for over 70 years. They conduct these massive surveys every year asking the people state by state a ton of different questions. And they aggregate all of this data to determine how religious the people are in the various states. And if you could read the scale on the upper left, you'd see the darker the green, the more religious those people are, the lighter, the less green. This is me. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. We are very religious. This is your diocese. As you can see, you are not as religious, at least in terms of the people that live in your area. Now, obviously, when I, when I do this, and, and th th there is some tongue in cheek here, but I also wanted to lay this out here from a from reliable data set. Because, because I travel the country, and, and a lot of my travels are Northeast, Midwest, and West Coast, I will frequently hear people come back to me and say, oh, well, that's easier for you guys in the South because everybody's religious. Now, if you think about it for two seconds, you think, you'd realize how foolish a thought that is. Because everybody is already religious, they are already stuck in whatever box they have been placed or put themselves in or volunteered to be in. It's a lot harder to move somebody out of a box that's already put themselves in a box. What I look at this is from an opportunity perspective, I believe you all have enormous opportunity in your geography because there are a greater number of people in your geography. Now, not as good as it does in the West Coast and the Northeast. I mean, we just finished the strategic plan for the OCA Diocese of New England and look up to the upper right-hand corner and see how white that area is. I said to them, folks, if y'all don't triple this church in about three years, we, you're missing the opportunity. This, there's a little hanging fruit everywhere. You just step outside your church door and start going door to door and there's, there's nuns everywhere you come into. So the, the point here is really to understand that I think there is some enormous opportunity in your geography to reach out to the point that was made earlier in terms of one of the challenges when we start to think about outreach and evangelism. I think that we have some unique opportunities. And I think that's really kind of what I wanted to leave you kind of with a, a little bit of a ray of hope there. So the numbers are all bad. The trends are all bad. If I did the economic analysis, which I'm not doing in this one, that's more covered in the stewardship program, you'd see how bad they are. But this is not the day we want to meet our maker. So I'm just telling you, I hope y'all 
do really well tonight. And I hope you wake up tomorrow morning so we can roll up our sleeves and get busy. Because I hope that you are now feeling a sense of urgency that we can do something that could make a big difference, not only for our journey to salvation, but for the journeys of others. There are so many people that we need to bring closer to Christ, including so many that are already attending our church, but are in those incidental categories. We can't forget to catechize them, as well as all those out there that we need to reach out to and evangelize and bring them to the true faith. And so this is a, this is a message with all of the bad news of enormous opportunity. And it is taking the opportunity that we have in the face of the bad news and saying, we have to be risk takers. We need to make some change. We need to make good and positive change. So that leads us to the process that we're gonna go through. Now, we always like to have a little bit of fun here. You'll, you'll forgive me, I, I'm, I'm a little bit losing my voice over here. I um, Some of you know that I do an Ancient Faith Radio live call-in show and um, yesterday was the live call-in show and my, my guest was Chris Hillman, who was uh, the, one of the founders of the Birds and Manassas Brothers and Burrito Brothers and, and what a famous rock and roll Hall of Famer, happens to be an Orthodox Christian. And we had so much fun on the thing. It was, it was over a two-hour program, and I lost my voice. So I'm going to do the best I can, but we'll move through this pretty quickly. But it's okay to have a little fun along the way. So when we start to talk about strategic planning, I wanted you to understand that, that, that there is a literary background for this. It's not just a business discipline. And, and it's actually described in a wonderful scene in Alice in Wonderland. And some of you who haven't read Alice in Wonderland to your kids or grandkids, or for yourself a while may remember this scene. It's a scene where Alice is standing at a fork in the road and doesn't know where to go. And the Cheshire cat is standing right in the middle of that. And so Alice looks to the Cheshire cat and says, which road should I take? And the Cheshire cat looks at her and said, where do you want to go, little girl? And Alice responds honestly, I don't know. And the Cheshire cat with great wisdom says, then it makes no difference. But brothers and sisters, if we don't know where we want to go, it makes no difference which route we take. It may or may not be appropriate. And so the point of this is really to suggest to you that it is critically important to have clarity about where you want to go. Now, none of you back in the days when we traveled would ever go think of going to O'Hare or Midway or the local airport wherever you live and say, give me an airplane ticket to somewhere right? You would always have an idea of what your destination is. Those of you that go anywhere, you have an idea of your destination. And yet when we think about it in the context of our churches, our parishes, arguably the most important place of our life and our passion, we sometimes lose sight of what our vision is and where we're going. And that's really what we want to accomplish. That's what we really want to do here. Now, lest you think that strategic planning is just some business exercise or something that, that Lewis Carroll came up with in Alice in Wonderland, I will hopefully convince you that strategic planning is biblical in its foundation. Every element in strategic planning derives its origin from biblical passages and biblical practices. And I'm not making this thing up. This is not because I'm trying to sell you anything because I don't sell anything. I'm telling you that ultimately, if we follow scripture, it led us on the path of doing every element of what is now strategic planning. And those of us that got our MBAs and those of us that worked in the business world, we called strategic planning as something we invented when actually it derived with biblical foundation, and I'm going to prove it to you. So when we start to think about the very essence of planning, we can look at Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people will perish. And it is in the, it is in the opportunity that you have been given by your archbishop to create a vision for your holy and sacred diocese that ultimately will support the vision for the parishes. And, and we do this so that we have clarity of where we're going and we know which road to take and so that our people will not perish either in a real sense or more importantly from a spiritual sense in that regard. Now, another way to kind of look at this from a, from a simplistic humanist perspective is to say that all strategic planning is, is a process to manage the busyness of our church without turning our church into a business. None of us want the church to be thought of in the context of a business, but yet there are tools that we can use to help manage the busyness of our parishes. So if you look at what strategic planning is in this context, it's real simple. It's, a, it's, it's really a process 
to define a strategy to allocate resources to achieve a vision. Now let's reverse engineer this. You have to have a vision of where you're going. And then you have to look at how am I going to take the available resources I have and allocate them in the most effective manner to achieve that vision. I mean, if you had unlimited resources, you would do something different than what we're going to do because we don't have unlimited resources. So we have to have clarity of our vision. Where do we want to go? We have to assess our operational resources. And then we have to have a strategy that allows us to use those resources to achieve the vision. Ultimately, all a strategic plan has to do is answer four critical questions. Why do we exist? Where are we now? Where do we want to be? And how will we get there? Let me ask it again. Why do we exist? We need to have this fundamental understanding of our fundamental purpose. Secondly, where are we now? Thirdly, logically, where do we want to be? And fourth, how are we going to get there? And through this process that we are going to abbreviate as abbreviated as has ever been abbreviated, hopefully by the end of this process, your sacred diocese, your blessed diocese will have absolute clarity and answers to all four of these questions. So essentially, when you start to think about strategic planning in the context of a church, there are four things you need to think about, right? So first, you need the right process. It has to be comprehensive, methodical, and there has to be a schedule attached to it. Now, we've taken the proven process that we've used before, and with His Eminence's help, we've tailored it to your specific circumstances. So we're going to be testing some new things here. You're going to do everything that's always done, but we're going to do some things to try and accelerate the process. In, in the course of accelerating the process, there are few opportunities for engagement, which I hate, but it is what it is and we have to make progress. The second thing is you need a diverse and inclusive group of people, strategic thinkers, people that are willing to lead a process and we need to get as much input as we possibly can. And so we're using you all as that catalytic group of people and we're asking you to take advantage of the diversity that exists within you, whether you're lay, whether you're clergy, whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you're cradle, whether you're convert, whether you're in a big city, whether you're in a small city. And in fact, I wanna challenge you to think outside of just who you are. So remember, this plan has got to work for our diocese because it's got to work for all of our parishes and not all of our parishes are exactly alike. And so as we build a strategy, we need to build something that would make sense for the diocese as a whole. Thirdly, you need, you need to develop a good product, a comprehensive strategic plan with a detailed implementation plan and timeline. And I'm, I'm taking you now from 50,000 feet and eventually by the end of tomorrow, we're going to bring you down to about 10,000 feet. So just, you know, we're going to take you down slowly over here. And you're going to see what this product looks like. So right process, right people developing the right product. But here's the problem. Vast majority of strategic plans and nonprofits, indeed in profits and also in churches, fail. They don't fail because they had the wrong process, generally. They generally don't fail because they had the wrong people. They also generally don't fail because they developed the wrong product. They failed in the performance phase. They fail to implement what they came up with the strategy. They create this beautiful plan. It becomes a beautiful book. It gets filed on someone's shelf. And then about once a year, somebody looks at it and said, how are we doing? And they don't, and, and so everything we're going to do and the very vision of the, the, the stewardship calling strategic planning process that I developed is intended to drive you through a process that will reduce the possibility of your failure. Now you still may fail, but you won't fail because the process is going to fail. You'll fail because some people drop the ball. And hopefully we have built a process that can withstand that. Now, we don't have time to get into a whole bunch of background, a whole bunch of details, but one of my Ancient Faith Radio programs, and this was back from October 20 of 2016, was I actually presented a comprehensive summary approach to, cons uh, to uh, strategic planning. If you're interested, I would encourage you to go back and listen to that podcast. It's about an hour and a half long podcast, and I lay it out in a lot more detail. Similarly, as I mentioned to you, you can cheat and go look at the cheat, at the cheat sheet at the end. And if you go to my website, stewardshipcalling.com, and you go to the strategic planning tab, the first tab underneath it is a series of two two-hour videos where I explain strategic planning in the church context. Now, this was recorded at a parish about three, four, five years ago, so it's a little bit older. Vast majority of it is still relevant, so you can watch a couple of videos, or you can actually drop down and download any of the strategic plans you want to look at to see what some of the finished product looks like. Again, it's all out there for you to take a look at. All right. 
So let me tell you a little bit about the process that we're going to get going on um, for all of tomorrow and then for a period of time after tomorrow. So you didn't realize, you thought you're going to be done with us tomorrow. Well, guess what? You're not going to be done with us tomorrow, but you're going to have done the vast majority of heavy lifting tomorrow. And then there's going to be some group activities that you're going to do going forward. So let's look at what's involved in this process. So the first thing is the SWOT analysis. This is the where are we now? And you all participated in this SWOT analysis in the first set of homework where I asked you to identify the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, the things you do well, things you do not so well, some external things that could help and external things that could hurt us. And we're going to go through that tomorrow, and you're going to reach a consensus on what are the key conclusions that you will reach. Second, a statement of why, the compelling and inspirational reason why your diocese exists and why anyone should care about it and why anyone should want to join you on the journey. That's another activity we're going to do tomorrow. Third is your core values. These are beliefs that are shared among the, the parties that drive culture and priorities. In other words, if you embrace your core values, you will use core values to make decisions. You'll ask yourself, is this activity we're getting ready to undertake consistent with our core values? Or is it inconsistent with our core values? And if it's inconsistent with our core values, stop. Don't go any further. That is not an activity you should undertake. So these core values are beliefs that really provide you the, the moral compass, if you will, true north. Now, here's what's interesting. Every one of these elements are things you should apply in your life. Every one of these things are things you should apply in your family. Your family should have a set of core values. Your family should have a statement of why. Your family should know what its strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, just as you should do all of these things. And when you start to see an enculturated core value, you'll start to hear phrases like, I'll never forget one time when I, when, I, when I heard, when somebody asked one of my kids, you know, why are you doing that? And she said, well, that's just what we do. And the that's just what we do was a personification of a core value that was embraced and lived. We're going to develop a mission statement that says what we do. This is the tactics of what we do. And then finally, we're going to consolidate two things. Normally, you're used to seeing a vision statement, which is the where you want to be. We're going to approach it slightly differently for reasons dealing with the unique aspects of the diocese of, of the Midwest that we want to focus on. And we're actually going to use the four disciplines of execution to actually create a vision for where we want the diocese to be within a relatively short period of time. Now, here are here's a rule and a question that I, you're going to hear me over and over again say. Here's the rule. You cannot master what you do not measure. You cannot master what you do not measure. How do you possibly know you are mastering anything unless you have reliable measurement of it, right? So I'm going to always ask you, how are we going to measure effectiveness and success? And the proof of this is every church I go to and I do a program I always that has a Sunday school, I always ask them, do you have a good Sunday school? And they always answer, yes. And I go, great. How would I know? And they kind of look at me and like, well, we think we have a good Sunday school. And I said, that's wonderful. I hope so. You designed it. I hope you didn't design a lousy Sunday school. My question to you is, are you the beneficiaries of the Sunday school? And they go, well, well no, the kids are. And I said, well, then I don't really care what you think is good. My question to you is, how would I, an outsider to your parish, know that you have a good Sunday school program? And there's usually about three to five minutes of floundering. And then eventually somebody will ask the right question. They'll say, well, how would we measure that? And my response is, aha, now we've gotten to the right question. If you do not know how to measure what is important, then don't ever think you are successful at it. Maybe you are, but it's pure luck if you are. If, on the other hand, you have identified what it is that you're going to measure and how you're going to measure it, that tells me you've gone through the process of defining what success looks like. Because you can only create a metric when you know what success looks like. If I have a metric to weight lift a certain amount or lose a certain amount of weight or achieve a certain result, I now know what my endpoint is. I now know what the metrics are that allow me to do that. So we have gotten real lazy. Let me tell you why I say that again. Forgive me. I apologize. I should, you're going to hear me apologize to you a lot. I am not fussing at you folks, you know, but I, I'm doing what, what any evangelist ought to do. I'm just out here to preach the truth and wake you up. Okay. So you'll hear me say this again, and I don't mean anything bad by it, but I didn't come here to make you feel good. I just came here to tell you the truth and help you get better. All right. So here's the point. 
the point is in your business worlds, for those of you that were in the business world or those of you that have family in the business world, you'll know that every business has the metrics. They know exactly what it is they're supposed to measure and they measure it on a regular basis. You know, for 36 years, I was a lawyer in an 1100 lawyer law firm. Uh, we, we, we sold our time in six minute increments. We measured our time in tenths of an hour. We knew that every lawyer was accountable for a certain number of billable hours every year. And we would measure it by the week, by the month, by the quarter, by the year. No question about what we were measuring, right? Profitability, same way. In your personal life, some of you are good at measuring. So some of you know what your blood pressure should be or what your heart rate should be or what your cholesterol should be or what your diabetes level should be. And, and you're good at calorie counting. Some of you are good at it. So we're fantastic in our business life. We're okay, some of us in our daily life, but we're lousy at it in church world. The most important place where we ought to be looking for accountability is the place where we impose the least accountability on ourselves. And so for a process to be successful, we have to impose a degree of accountability on ourselves. Now, the process we're going to use has been a well-documented process. It was uh, created uh, uh, by the Franklin Covey organization. It, you can find it in a book called The Four Disciplines of Execution. I don't sell anything. I receive no commissions from anybody, but if there was one of the books that I think you ought to read, The Four Disciplines of Execution is one of the books I think you ought to read, just along, uh, alongside and a phenomenal book that was written by Al Wensman, who's the head of the Gallup uh, Church Organization, called Growing an Engaged Church. Those are two, I think, required readings. I have a whole required reading list on my website if you're interested. But let me give you a little bit of background on The Four Disciplines of Execution, what they refer to as 4DX. They started by surveying over 200,000 leaders of organizations, massive research. And they said, why is it when you failed that you failed to achieve a particular goal? Now, when you achieved a goal, we don't care about that. My question to you is when you failed to achieve a goal, why was it that you failed to achieve a goal? And what they found was that the number one reason was the chaos that exists in their day-to-day -day operations. It's what I call the tyranny of the urgent, right? They have these great ideas, these great goals, the great aspirations, and then daily life gets in the way of their business. And so what they figured out was that they were unable to focus a disproportionate amount of time on performing the right things to achieve the most important goals. Now, notice what they didn't say. You need to devote all your time to achieve the right goals no, no, they said a disproportionate amount of time. In other words, they recognized that the whirlwind is always around you. You are constantly being inundated with calls, requests, information to respond to this. A parishioner needs something. A, uh, the, the, the clergy needs something. The church needs something. Some, the, 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 the archbishop needs something, right? We're, we're constantly, and your kids, and your day job, and the neighborhood, and every organization that you're a party of needs something from you. That's the whirlwind. That's all the demands that are coming at you. You can't ignore the whirlwind. I mean, maybe if you were a monk, you could, you could narrow it, but we, have, we live in the whirlwind. We live with the tyranny of the urgent. The question is, how can we provide a disproportionate energy on a smaller number of things that'll make the biggest difference? Now, in an effort to try and provide some guidance on you, I was fortunate enough to get the principal author of the Four Disciplines of Execution, to come and do a podcast with me in August of this year. So if you go to, to you can access that either by my website, stewardshipcalling.com, tab at the end is the internet faith, inter, <clears throat> ancient faith radio, internet radio tab, and then you scroll down to August 5th and you can do it. The link is actually in the lower left-hand corner of the slide over here. So you can click on that link. Or if you're on the Ancient Faith Radio site, by all means, you can access it there. Go to Stewardship Calling, drop down to August 5th. So we've given you a variety of different ways to get it. So I got Jim Hewling, who's the principal author of the Four Disciplines of Execution, to come on and do a program. But I made him do something that was a little bit unique. Now, I could do this because Jim Hewling is a friend of mine. He's actually, he actually was a client of mine. 
I didn't know this at the time, but when I represented his technology company, he was actually experimenting and developing the four disciplines of execution. He then left his technology company that he was CEO of and went over to the Franklin Covey organization. When I said, what in the heck are you doing? He said, I've developed this process that you've seen me use and I think it makes the difference and we're gonna do this experiment with 200,000 uh, research experiment and we're gonna figure out what it is and lo and behold, it was. So what I did was I called my dear friend, Jim Keeling, and I said, Jim, I know that the Franklin Covey organization sells the four disciplines of execution for a lot of money. I want you to give it away for free for my Orthodox brothers and sisters by coming on and doing a podcast where we explain how we're going to use this in the Orthodox church. And he said, okay, well, I can do that because you're my friend and you know, we have a longstanding relationship. And I said, by the way, just so you know, I've already been doing it in some churches. So I'm going to share it with you what I've been doing and we're going to do it. So we tried to, in about an hour and a half or so, um, summarize the four disciplines of execution. And I certainly encourage you to listen to that. So, but now I'm going to give you the Bill Marianas Cliffsnote version. For those of you that aren't going to get the book, for those of you that aren't going to listen to the podcast or watch the videos, if you go to my website, I actually downloaded two videos where they teach the four disciplines of, not teach it, but they talk about it. One that's about 50 minutes long and one that's 12 minutes long. So if you go to my website and drop down to that part on there, you, you can actually see a 12 minute video that gives you this high level view of it. There are four disciplines of execution. So here's the first one. Determine your WIGs, your wildly important goals. Now look, you're gonna get tired of hearing some of these acronyms, but I wanted to lay the foundation tonight so that when we start working with it tomorrow, you're ready for it. The wildly important goals are the most important objectives that you need to achieve, but they won't be achieved unless you provide special attention to them. Here's the phrase you're gonna hear me say over and over and over again. What are the few things that will change everything? What are the few things that will change everything? What are the couple of things that we can do that if only we did those couple of things, we'd see a massive improvement in other aspects and things that we do, okay? Those are your wildly important goals. Again, this is a note version, so I'm going through this quickly. Don't worry, tomorrow when we actually develop your wildly important goals, I'll give you more education. But I wanted to take this time to give you a little bit of foundation. Second thing, acting on lead measures. Well, there's two kinds of measures. There's lag measures and lead measures. We're actually going to define both, but we're only going to act on our lead measures. So what are we talking about? Lag measures track the ultimate success of a WIG. When you get to the end of your year, you look at how much money did we make or how many people did we have, you know, take communion or how many people did we get through this educational program? That's a lag measure. It's at the end. When you're looking at the lag measure, there's nothing you can do to change those results. It's just the final end point. But what we're going to do is we're going to understand what those lag measures are that we want to accomplish. Remember back to my Sunday school example, I was saying, how would we define success? in what we want to accomplish. That's our lag measure. But what our lead measure is going to be, what are the things that we need to track, the activities we need to track that will allow us to achieve our lag measures? Because now what we're going to manage towards is those things that we can actually do to make a difference. So you're, we're going to talk at greater length on lead measures and lag measures. You are actually going to develop them for your wildly important goals. And I'm actually going to give you some examples. The third thing we're going to do is create, the third discipline is a compelling scoreboard. We know human nature is what it is, that the highest engagement comes when people know the score and that the best scoreboard is actually designed for and by the players. Any of you who have ever played any game, whether it's a sport or a card game or anything, you know, when you're just out there just playing around, shooting baskets or throwing the ball around or, you know, playing cards, it's just easy, it's fun, it's relaxing. And then when somebody says, okay, now we're gonna keep score, your level of play changes, right? So we're going to create a compelling scoreboard for the things that we're going to do. But what we're going to focus on are the things that are most important that those of us that are executing these things need to manage and not the millions of details. I mean, what the reason why I developed my financial stewardship analysis process for parishes is because what I found is that parish councils and diocese councils were, were getting bogged down in all the minutia of all of these numbers, and they were missing the few things that were most important. So I got them narrowed down to three things, and now I focus their attention on it. And now they know what they need to manage. The fourth thing, we're not really going to talk about this at this point uh, tomorrow. 
it's going to be at the very end when we gather together to finalize, and that's a cadence of accountability. Remember I told you that the vast majority of plans fail, not because the wrong people developed the, went through the wrong process to develop the wrong product. It's because they didn't properly perform it. We're going to create a cadence of accountability that allows his eminence and the leadership team that's going to be implementing this strategic plan to constantly keep tabs on where we are in achieving this goal. And we're going to do this not for punitive purposes, but so that we can remind ourselves that these are the most important things that we wanted to accomplish. Now, all of this is going to be done in the context of consensus. Y'all are probably well versed in consensus, so you don't need me to do my long tutorial on consensus. So I'll give you the Cliff's Note version. It's merely seeking the common mind through a process of respectful dialogue without formal votes. It means an agreement that everyone can live with, even though it won't be your first choice. Now, this is one of the things I'm gonna ask for your forgiveness on. If we were doing a regular full-blown retreat, we would have three days. We'd have multiple conversations, small groups breaking you up, developing this, da 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 da, da. We'd get you all together. We'd, we'd spend whatever time it takes to develop a consensus. Because of the challenges imposed upon us, not of our making and not of our choosing, we're going to have to consolidate this. And con Now, if, if at any given point in time you feel I'm rushing or pushing, then respectfully just raise your hand and I can slow this thing down. I can slow this train down again. And if it, if it takes us off the tracks, we'll go down the track. Because at the end of the day, it is important to maintain this process of consensus. You will not get what you want necessarily. But we want you to get something you can live with, something you can support, something you can say, I think it's worth a shot. I think this is, this is what we ought to do, okay? And ultimately, we're going to be able to reach consensus when we've had a discussion that's full and fair and everybody can just live with the result, okay? Now, again, in a full-blown process, and when I do this at parishes or at, in live programs, by golly, it is a wonderful thing because it's really hard to build consensus if you're not used to using consensus as a model, right? Uh, but it's a great tool. Now, one other thing I wanted to cover. In order to do this right, it's going to take two teams. First is the strategic planning team. This is that diverse group of cross-section of representative people, strategic thinkers that actually develop the plan. This, my brothers and sisters, is you. You are the SPT. So when you hear me talk about the SPT, you are this group. We're going to do the best we can to develop this strategic plan. Then your job as a strategic planning team is over. You'll get a certificate or something. No, anyway. Uh, and then we're going to recruit the second team, and that's the implementation team. These are the people who are responsible for actually implementing what you all have decided needs to be done. To be sure, we hope every one of you will continue onto the implementation team and, be, and join one of the task forces to actually get this implemented. But we recognize that not everyone has been given gifts from God that make them good at implementation and some are better just at the strategy side of the equation. Or some may have things happening in their lives or their circumstances or their parishes. We get it, okay? We hope that you will carry on to the implementation team, but if you can't, you can't. But what I want you to be thinking about as we go through this process, and that's the reason why I'm telling you this now, is we will be recruiting a broader group from throughout the diocese for the purpose of building the teams necessary to do this. And again, even this is scriptural in its foundation. Now, there's plenty of scripture passages that teach this, but this is the one that I always love the most in all the years that I, I coached church leagues and stuff like that. The one team, one dream basis with, you know, came from this passage from Ecclesiastes, where two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. But listen to what comes next. If either of them fall down, one can help the other up but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. And so my brothers and sisters, one of the objectives that his eminence has in this process is to help build a team. That's not to say you don't have good teams. That's not to say you haven't had good teams. That's not to say that there isn't great teamwork and camaraderie, but that is to say that no matter how good your team is, it can be better. And no matter how good that team gets, it can be better again. And so we're constantly on the journey of building a team. Now, all of this, if you go back to 50,000 feet, you're going to find out something that, you know, is his, his eminence knows, but maybe you didn't realize. Why are we doing this? Well, again, we're going to come back to four. See, I'm a Trinitarian in everything, and this always makes me uncomfortable when I have to come up with four things rather than three things, okay? But as it turns out, there's four things that you're going to get when you do strategic planning properly. 
You're going to get a plan. See, that's all you thought you were going to come up with. You thought at the end of this process, we're going to have a strategic plan. We can check that off the box. We can th thank his eminence for his hard work. But I'm telling you, there's three other things. Here's where my Trinitarian nature comes in that you're going to get if we do this right. You're going to get inspired and dedicated teams. We're going to be able to get you working together as a team better than ever before. And as we go into the implementation phase, we're going to have even more uh, teamwork and activities. Secondly, we're going to learn and get comfortable with consensus as a decision-making process. If you're already there, check this one off the box. But quite frankly, it's very hard, particularly those of us that live in this democratic republic called the United States, to think about consensus as a model for decision-making when we're so used to the more hierarchical or majority vote kinds of thing. And fourthly, we're going to create an energized and improved diocese culture. Now, don't hear me say that there's anything wrong with the culture, but it is to say that no matter how good the culture is, the world around you is changing and it's changing at a dramatically, at a dramatic pace. And we can always improve the culture. And when we improve that culture, we can always improve it again. So we always ought to be invested in creating better, inspired, and dedicated teams, learning and managing better by consensus, and energizing and improving our culture. Those are three things we should always be focused on. Now, everything that this in this presentation, this entire deck, is available to you on the website. Again, there it is, stewardshipcalling.com. Go to strategic planning. Drop down to the you know, OCA Diocese in the Midwest, this deck is already up there along with the homework that I asked you to look at, which I, as I said, 13 or 14 of you did because I saw 13 or 14 logins on my website. Uh, and I hope the rest of you who haven't will get a chance to look at it. I want you to just scatter down there and look at the, the and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop this share right now and I'm going to share with the uh, thing and we're, then we're going to go to Q&A, okay? So bear with me on the Q&A. So right now you should be seeing, this is, this is my website. This is the, the homepage is up here, but I already went to strategic planning and I already went down to the OCA Diocese of Midwest and this is your page, okay? So the agenda that we're going to be following is the first tab. You'll note that there is a slight revision from the agenda that, that was shared with you previously. Okay, so don't worry about it, but there's a slight adjustment. The presentation I have just completed is the next thing that you can download right there. The next four elements are the heat map version of your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Then we have the, the edited version of your mission statement. So I took the mission statements that you all offered and I tried to edit them down. By the way, those are the things that when you completed the survey, the voting uh, that you got on, on the survey monkey, um, that's what you were voting against. And, and the results are fascinating, fascinating, absolutely captivatingly fascinating. When, when you see it tomorrow, there was one place where you all fell almost perfectly in line with what I'm used to seeing and one place where you were nowhere near what I'm used to seeing and you all were in all kinds of different places. And again, I wish we were all together to kind of build this consensus. So we're going to have some real fun uh, tomorrow, but we're going to have some special fun when we do one of these things. Uh, and then you'll see the heat map version of the wildly important goals. Okay. So, and then if you wanted to, this is where all the homework was and things of that nature, but I'd stay stop up here to the mini retreat stuff and all of that will be available to you. Uh, to take a look at. Okay. So I'm going to stop the share now and we're going to get into the Q and A in whatever time we have left. And I know there's some comments in the chat room. All right. Let me address those if I can. Um, so our, uh, uh, the first question is, are all the fig are figures, all Christians in general or just Orthodox statistics? Great question. Um, the ones that are most relevant to you are just Orthodox. So the 47% that left the church, Orthodox only. The, the statistic of, of, uh, of the percentage of youth that are leaving, that's the one that is across all Christian denominations. We have not yet developed the survey of just Orthodox Christians. It is statistically significant data. It is data that has been confirmed. Not only the, the, the ones that I cited came from uh, Barna Research Group, the Pew Forum, and the Public Religion Research Institute. Um, the 
National Study of Youth and Religion has done an even more extensive, because they've been at it for 16 years now at Notre Dame, uh, surveying this. And, and they, they have a cohort of, I think, like over 33,000 uh, young people. It is statistically significant for all denominations. But as you might imagine, given our statistical prevalence in the United States, Orthodox are un underrepresented in, in all of that. But even within the Orthodox subdata, because we actually asked them to look at this for us, um, our numbers, while much smaller in, in raw N, the, percentage were, the percentages were matching. So we have no reason to believe that that one thing of youth departure is different in the Orthodox ecosystem. But to be sure, we don't have the reliable data yet. We're getting, we're, we're getting ready to get that. Uh, Your Eminence, if you remember the conversation at the Assembly of Bishops when we talked about that, that app that we're creating to be able to do research polling, one of the things that we want to do with that is use that as a vehicle to gather nothing but pure, reliable Orthodox data. So the departure of cradle Orthodox is, is truly Orthodox. The percentage attending church is just Orthodox. The percentage of attendance is just Orthodox. The youth number is across all Christian denominations. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, and and that's, uh, yeah, Father Alexander was, was, was commenting on that. And so uh, you see that in the answers to the side, um, you, you know, what you're trying to do is, 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 Look at look at the, the 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 footnote at the bottom, and that will usually tell you um, if it's just for Orthodox or not. So the question the 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 question that Simeon asked is a fantastic question, and that is what's the metric for passion for the faith? And that is a great that is a great great question. I, this shows me that somebody's actually listening, right? Because I've been talking about metrics, 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 and I'm getting the question. So what are your metrics? Okay, so if this is where it's going to, I'm going to give you the short answer, but it's a lot longer answer. Um, the, the Gallup organization has developed a series of metrics that they look at to ascertain the level of someone's, and they don't call it passion for the faith. And that's why I said it's passion for the faith, understanding of the faith, practice the faith. You can use whatever you want to. They have a series of metrics that they've looked at. And it includes things that you would expect to be on the list. Like, for example, regular attendance at services. If you're in a sacramental church, regular participation in sacraments, um, uh, Bible reading, prayer, the, the kinds of things that are easy to imagine, right? But their data actually is more robust in that it goes into other categories of activities. So those of you that started talking about engagement, right, in the church and levels of what am I doing in serving others and things of that nature. So Gallup has identified and created a matrix. And by the way, it is that same matrix that they've been refining over 70 years, but it's what they've been using to create that green state map that I showed you earlier. The best book, and remember I alluded to this earlier, I didn't know that question was there, so it, you know, this is prescient, this, this is foreshadowing of the, of the, of the greatest order. Uh, another, I think, required reading book that I encourage everybody in church to read is Al Winsman's book, Growing an Engaged Church, Growing an Engaged Church, and I can provide you links uh, to all of that. In fact, if you go to my website uh, in the resources tab, um, if, if you'll forgive me, I, I'll, I'll do that right now just so I can show you what I'm talking about. Um, so this is, I'm going to share back to my, my website. If I did this correctly, are you seeing your page? Okay, great. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up here and you'll see that there's a resources tab, right, in the lower part. And if you click down on the resources tab, actually the first one are stewardship sound bites. These are articles that I've written that you are free to copy, plagiarize, edit any way you want to, and include in your bulletins to try and inspire greater stewardship generosity from your parishioners. So that's just one of the resources that I provide. Um, down here is the stewardship ministry handbooks. I'm not going to cover that. But if you click on this one here, books, videos, resources, podcast, etc., you'll be taken to a downloadable link of recommended books, TED Talks, YouTube videos, podcasts, research studies, and other useful information. Now, I'm going to click on that link. And in order to actually share it with you, I've actually got to switch screens here. And actually, because it opens up, it opens up a, a PDF. Um, and so you can, you can actually download that PDF. And I'm going to now share that PDF, uh, oh, let's get rid of this screen here. See, so this is what happens when you have too many screens going on at the same time, right? All right, 
share screen. So this is the PDF of resources that I recommend. This is, this is my vetted list of every aspect of it. And what I've done is, uh, so there's a lot of background information, but here's where the books start, right? And I have them in categories. So if you're looking at church transformation, these are three books that, that I recommend in the church transformation area. Uh, here is uh, on culture and leading, but this is the one I wanted to focus your attention on. So it's the one on the left. It's called Growing an Engaged Church. I like, by the way, the, the, the subtitle on this one, How to Stop Doing Church and Start Being the Church Again. Uh, what a great subtitle. It's written by Al Winsman, and Al is the, the, the practice leader for the Gallup Organization on Faith-Based Organizations. What he does in this book is he takes that, all of that data that I told you is what you measure to understand people that are higher up on that, that spectrum of passion or understanding or practice of the faith. And, and he presents the empirical data that Gallup has gathered. And then he also gives you guidance from their best practices on how to implement that in your parishes. And so this is one of those things that I think is required reading for every parish council and every clergy and every, every church leader. Uh, and it's, fairly, it's a fairly easy read. I mean, they did a really good job of, of writing it that way. So this is the book that I was referring to. And when you go through this book, what you'll see is the answer to the question of how do I go about, you know, figuring out this passion of faith. And then there's, there's a bunch of book on operational excellence. You'll see the 40X process in there. And I talk a little bit about that. And we're going to talk about some of the rest of these, but I'm not going to spend any time with them now. I just wanted you to know that they are available to you out there. Um, and, 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 and so it's there. Um, in answer to Bob's question, attendance is one of the measures, but it's only one of the measures, right? Because if, 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 you, if you have attendance, but low engagement, then you don't get as much credit as if you have attendance and high levels of engagement. And so how, do we, how could we look at that? So I'll give you one simplistic example. Uh, so in a, in a segment that I talk about in terms of increasing engagement, and this is in the fourth module on an effective worship experience, um, higher level of engagements, and, and I'm going to give you a very precise orthodox answer, uh, although this applies elsewhere, but it's really acutely valuable in the orthodox context. Higher levels of liturgical engagement occur when one specific practice is implemented systematically in the parish. What is that one practice? Nobody wants, to, nobody wants to play tonight. Okay, I'll give you the answer. Coffee hour. <laughs> but yeah, yes, Father, except only when the coffee's good, okay? When the coffee is bad, it's horrible because then everybody leaves, right? So you have to serve good coffee. This, this, I joke about it, but it's not a joke. I'm serious about this. In my will is a grant when I die to the cathedral with specific instructions that that money is to be used to rip out every coffee maker at the cathedral, in the call, and in the in the uh, Hellenic Center, and to replace it with good coffee makers and a lifetime supply, not a lifetime, but a perpetual supply of good coffee. Anyway, so the single, there's other factors, okay, but one single thing that can make, the one thing that can change everything is congregational singing. What we see is parishes that have embraced congregational singing to a high level of activity and a high priority have higher levels of engagement of everybody sitting in the pews. And I'll give you a concrete example. This comes from an Antiochian parish that I was working with in the Midwest. Um, not, 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 your, not any of your parishes, but it was in the Midwest. And uh, they embraced congregational singing. And I think the most effective way I've ever seen an Orthodox parish do it. They, they took their choir. They had a good choir. They took their choir and they gave them assigned seats in the congregation. And they spread them out over the entire church. It's not a big church. So that no matter where you sat, you were no more than a pew or two away from a good voice. The choir director then stood in the front of the church with his back towards the altar at the foot of, of you know, the solea there. And he directed the entire congregation with all of his choir members singing along inside there. We sat and did counts. And what we found was, and they didn't know we were counting. So this wasn't one of those where, you know, they, they know we're counting. So let me fake that I'm singing. 
we found that that better than 80% of the congregation was singing at any given point in time. And not everybody sang on every hymn. And so when you aggregated across all hymns, what we found is there were over 90% of the people were singing at one point or another. Now, obviously, they had to choose their hymns a little bit more carefully to make them more accessible to people that are not trained in the musical arts. And those that were more sophisticated hymns were a smaller number of people engaged in it. But nobody, everybody felt a sense of engagement at a high level. Now, again, that's just one very simplistic example. I'm not here to suggest that you do that. What I am suggest here suggesting is attendance, while relevant, is more relevant when we look at engaged levels of attendance. So that that 70 to 80% of the time when your mind is wandering, you don't get a lot of points for that, okay? And then the, the, uh, the last uh, question that's on here is their data as to why Americans have left churches. Boy, is there, <laughs> is the answer to your question. Boy, is there a lot of data on that. And um, I, I have it. I love talking about it. I am not going to talk to you about it until at the earliest, the end of tomorrow, or more likely at the end of the next time we get together. And the reason why is I don't want to drive you in that direction, in a direction. I want to facilitate, not drive, right? So I'll present you data of the, the state of where things are. And periodically, you'll hear me give you a suggestion like I just did with the congregational singing. And what I'm going to do, though, is it's a, you'll get the benefit of this, is I've got the data from Christian churches, but I also have something that's unique. And again, I'm not selling anything, so I'm not, I'm not this isn't an attaboy moment. You, I get no credit for this. But having done this now for 13 years and completed these plans for 26% of the Orthodox Christians and over 500 parishes, I have Orthodox data. So what's going to happen is one of the validation checks that I'm going to do for you is look at where you take this. I'm here just to facilitate where you want to go and validate it against the empirical orthodox data first, because that's the most relevant, and then to the extent relevant, the, the greater Christian data. And if you're off the reservation, that doesn't mean we're not going to put, we're going to take you and put you back on the reservation. We're just going to make sure that we understand why you're off the reservation, make sure that that's where you want to be, okay? Uh, and I also want to make sure that you, you're, you're in line with what's happening. So, for example, um, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, we presented to the entire diocese assembly of the Diocese of the Northeast the strategic plan that their group, like you, developed, right? And um, his beatitude was the, uh, was the presiding hierarch, because as you know, that, that diocese is without a presiding hierarch, and his beatitude serves as locum tenens. So he was kind of presiding over that session. And, uh, and that was kind of interesting and fun to kind of, because this was, he was going through some of this for the first time. Um, and what happened, we got towards the end of it, and then somebody asked the, the question that was kind of posed over here, like, they didn't ask it this way, but basically, is where we ended up the right place? Now, they didn't say it that way. It was more articulately done. And, and, and I was able to then jump in. You know, his beatitude offered some, his perspective on it, which was very valuable and very on, uh, on point. But I was able to say, let me validate where you ended up. It's exactly where you should have ended up based on all of this other data set that's out there. Doesn't mean you, you, you did everything that's on that list, but it means that nothing on your list is off the main list of what it ought to be. So there was no, none of these one-offs that we need to worry about. Every one of the ones they focused on were in the sweet spot of what we find from the empirical data within the Orthodox ecosystem. So forgive me, I'm not trying to tease anybody, but I don't, I don't want to shape your answers tomorrow as we go through the process. I want you to come to these answers you know, in your own discussion. So I've answered all the ones in the chat room. Are there any other questions? Yeah, Bill, uh, you mentioned something about uh, we, not, we did not schedule any meetings with you beyond, beyond tomorrow. I know. Talking about group meetings, are these assignments that you're talking about that we'll work on or what? Oh, no. He's already called me out on this, man. I just I thought I was going to be able to sneak that by his eminence. And he said, oh, no, not so fast, Ace. My plan is I'm driving to Cleveland on Wednesday to make it in time for our diocesan council business meeting. So no worry. No worry. I, I am, if nothing, a gracious taskmaster. Okay. So let me tell you, and you're a step ahead of me again, your eminence, but let me just tell you what 
because you have collapsed an enormous amount of work in a short period of time, you can't get it all done in the amount of time that we have. But here's what we are going to get done. We will have finished, by the grace of God, assuming we stay on track, and if we don't, that's okay. We'll figure it out. We will have answered question number one, why do we exist? We will have answered question number two, where are we now? We will have answered the question, what do we do? And we will have answered the question, where do we want to go? What we will have not answered is the fourth question, that is exactly how we're going to get there. And the way we're going to do that is at the end of tomorrow, we will have identified the one, two, or three, maybe if you twist my arm, and maybe if you threaten me, I may allow you to go to four, but we're going to have a real argument if we want to go beyond that. Specific, wildly important goals that will allow you to do everything you want to do. But what we don't have time to do in just a short amount of time we do uh, have is to create, okay, what are the lag measures that allow us to measure the achievement of that goal? What are the lead measures that allow us to manage the lag measures? And what's the scoreboard that's going to allow us to keep track? So what we're going to do at the end of tomorrow is if you, and let's say we end up with three wildly important goals, you all will volunteer to work on a small team just in one of those wildly important goals. And then over the next couple of months, right? I know we got the holidays coming up. I know that's a little tricky in that regard. We're going to schedule a couple of Zooms, no more than a couple of Zooms, each of the task forces. And we're going to, we're going to tackle every one of those things. And we're going to come up with a very comprehensive plan that shows you exactly what the, the wig is, what the scoreboard is, what the lead and lag measures are, and a step-by-step -step action plan that will allow you to achieve that. And then with your grace, with your permission, we're going to gather everybody back together again where everybody gets to look at what the other groups did, right? So that you are all comfortable that these three goals and the action plans associated with them, or four, are the best work you can do. And at that point, this planning phase is done. And then we start recruiting the implementation phase. So it won't happen the next day or the day after, et cetera, et cetera. We'll coordinate over the next several months just a couple of Zoom sessions with each of the small groups just to work in a small group. Did that answer your question? Sure, yeah, okay. Okay, great. Any other questions? Well, these have been, these have been absolutely phenomenal questions. I, I appreciate your patience. I know we went 16 minutes long tonight, um, even though we started five minutes late. So, uh, you know, I'm only accountable for 11 minutes of that overlap over there. So please accept my apologies for, for taking that portion of your life. Um, this video, when we're done with it, will be record. It's being recorded when it's processed and stuff like that. Um, I guess you'll put it up on Philip on some YouTube page or something that you manage at the diocese, and you'll send me a link, and I'll put the link up on my website. So again, you can have everything in one place. Um, but you'll be able to have that there. In the meantime, the PowerPoint is already up there, as are all of the heat map uh, data from the stuff. And if you just bang around on it for about 10 or 15 minutes tonight on those the heat map data in there, just to get a zen for feeling what it's looking like, that would be absolutely great if you haven't already done so. If not, uh, it's my understanding that we begin promptly at 9 Central, 10 Eastern. Is that correct, Your Eminence? Correct. That's All me. right. So, assuming there... For that meeting this evening. I'm sorry? Send out the Zoom link for that meeting this evening. Yeah, I think Philip said he was going to do that after we're done here. Is that correct, Philip? I already sent it just a few minutes ago, but yes, there's one link for everything that we're doing tomorrow. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's for all of tomorrow. Yeah, and when you go look at the revised schedule, what you'll see is there are several planned breaks. And then, of course, I wanted to beat you through with no lunch and no dinner, but his eminence was much more gracious than I was. So he said, no, we're not, we need to let them eat. And, uh, and so all kidding aside, um, we have a lunch break, we have a dinner break, we have several breaks in between. Um, uh, and, in, and at least one of those breaks, you actually have to do a little bit of work. So uh, they're not really full breaks in the full sense of, of everything in there. But I think when you get done uh, tomorrow, while you'll be tired, of course, I think you will be 
God willing, you'll be invigorated because you'll actually start to see clarity about values and vision and whys and, 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 and you'll, you'll have concluded what is the most important things we need to work on and we'll start to be developing a plan. And I'm actually gonna show you an example of what your end product is gonna look like. And I specifically chose something that's not gonna make your list based on the data that I've already processed. So I, I hope by the grace of God that when we get done tomorrow, you'll feel a, a, a sense of energy uh, and tonight, I hope you lose a lot of sleep just thinking about all of the data that we presented to you so that as we stand before the awesome judgment seat of Christ, you can say, we did everything we, we could, Lord, with what you gave us. Okay. So closing prayer, and then we're done. How about it? Okay. It is truly me to bless you, Theotokos, ever blessed and most pure, the mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim and more glorious beyond compared to the seraphim. Without corruption, you gave birth to God the word. True Theotokos, we magnify you. Thank you so much, everybody. I hope you have a blessed and good night and an enjoyable night. And we'll see you at 9 a.m. promptly, if not sooner. Okay. All right. God bless everybody. Everybody.